The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Amy Goal. I'm the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. Just a few pieces of information before we get started. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the evaluation to provide us with feedback on the program. For those who wish to receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the partnership's YouTube channel. We will be muting all attendees' phones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. Please write questions in the question box, and the speaker will respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of the program. And now I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Judith King. Judith is a master's prepared social worker who has worked in the field of addictions for over 30 years. She holds a BA in Early Childhood Education, and she received her MSW in Group Work Sequence from Rutgers University School of Social Work. Aside from her certification as a licensed clinical social worker, Judith is also an FASD educator, licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, and a certified perinatal addiction specialist. She currently works at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey as the manager for the Perinatal Addictions Prevention Project. Welcome, Judy. Thank you, Amy. I'd also like to welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you for participating. Some of you may have a lot of this knowledge and it may be a review for you. Some of you may have knowledge of some of this information and some parts will be new to you. And then others that are listening, it may all be new to you. But whatever your level of knowledge on this subject, I'm glad that you have joined us. Our objectives for today, we're gonna to talk about what e-cigarettes are, how they work. We're gonna learn about some of the health effects that e-cigarettes and vaping can cause. We're gonna talk about the associated lung injury, and we're going to talk about how e-cigarettes e can affect pregnancy. And lastly, we're gonna talk about vaping and our youth. Amy's also already has explained to you about the learning outcome, but we hope that you will be able to use this information in your professional practice. I have no vested interest. E-cigarettes were introduced in 2007, and we use the term vaping instead of smoking. It's a battery-operated device that's designed to deliver nicotine through a vapor instead of smoke. Some of the terms that are used to describe these devices are e-cigarettes, e-hookahs, vape pens, tank systems, or Juul. And we'll talk more about the Juul in a little bit. But you can see that there's a battery, an atomizer, and a cartridge. And you push the cartridge into the atomizer. And this picture shows a little bit more of how it works. You put the cartridge in and the battery, once you start trying to inhale in that, the sensor triggers the battery to deliver a vape of the e-juice or the e-liquid. And that's why it's called vaping because of, of the vapor that comes out of it. These are different types of e-cigarettes, they don't all look the same. 
So if you have teenagers in your house or other people and you say, oh, what are you using? It doesn't always look like that cigarette. It can have a lot of different forms. So what's in e-cigarettes? Well, first of all, there is nicotine in there. It's not as much nicotine as in a regular cigarette. However, it does have nicotine in it. Some people will buy extra strength cartridges to get more nicotine, or they'll increase the voltage to get a greater hit of the nicotine. And sometimes this is when they do some adjustments on that battery is when some of them will explode if they start messing around with it. But there are also things like lead and nickel and tin, these heavy metals that are in there. There are chemicals that are known to cause cancer. There's ultra fine particles, just little things in there that go into your lungs. Formaldehyde, that's embalming fluid. Acetone, sometimes you see that in your nail polish remover. Diacetylene, this is what causes popcorn lung. Popcorn lung was described among the popcorn industry. This chemical is part of what they spray on your popcorn to give it the butter flavoring. And if you ingest it, if you eat it, it's fine. But what they found was the workers in the popcorn industry that were using this and breathing it in, they started having little holes in their lungs. And so between the holes in the lungs and it being the popcorn industry, that's why they call it popcorn lung. There's also propylene glycol, glycerin, and acrolein, which is an, an ingredient, a chemical that's often used in weed killers. So in 2018, the U US Surgeon General you know, reminded everybody that the vape that comes out of the cigarette, either what they are exhaling or what's coming from the cigarette, if you are by someone, you are getting those same chemicals that are in that chemical that they're ingesting. So you have to be very careful not to be by people that are vaping if you don't want all those chemicals into your lungs. Just like staying away from somebody that's a regular smoker, there is that secondhand effect. So the Juul was launched in 2015. And you can see up in the corner what it looks like. It looks like a little uh, flash drive. And they use those little pods, those little green things. Those are the pods. And they're inserted into the Juul device. They contain one of those little pods contains as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. And I have spoken with people that use two and three pods a day. So they're smoking the equivalent nicotine wise of two and three packs of cigarettes a day. One of the reasons individuals like this is it doesn't emit as much smoke cloud as some of the other ones. So the teenagers like it because they can kind of hide it a little bit easier than the ones that, that cause a lot of the vape. There are also skins or wraps that are available to make that container that holds the pods more attractive. And the term that the, you use is jeweling instead of vaping. And this has been very, very popular. It was really pushed. And in 2017, the sales increased 600%. And when they kind of surveyed the, the youth that were using it, 63% didn't know that they, those pods contained nicotine. And here you can see some of the wraps that are available. And you can go online, you can see all kinds. They come in so many different varieties and, and patterns. And you can also see that they can be charged 
in your computer. And parents that may not know what they're looking for, just see their teenager or young adult with what they think is a flash drive. So the jewel pods use what they call nicotine salts. And the nicotine salts are derived from your leaf tobacco. It's touted as being less acidic than other e-cigarettes and creates more of the experience of smoking like a regular cigarette. And the nicotine peaks in about five minutes. It's more readily absorbed into the bloodstream. And this is something that we will talk about when we talk about health effects. And of course, it increases the rate of the nicotine delivery because it's so packed with nicotine. It decreases, or what they claim is they decrease the harsh sensation in the mouth, throat, chest, and lungs. And you only need a very few puffs to feel the satisfaction of that nicotine. But on the other side, because it contains some benzoic acid, there can be coughing, sore throat, and abdominal pain. Juul actually has a lot of lawsuits against them for false advertising and not advertising how packed this is with nicotine. And I used to hear advertisements on the radio for Juul, and lately I haven't heard anymore. So I think they're backing off a little bit because this can be very, very addictive. Nicotine, the addictive part, these are very, very addictive. So what are some of the health effects that we see from e-cigarettes? The FDA reports that there has been pneumonia, it affects the heart. It causes some disorientation, can cause some seizures and hypotension. And we'll talk more about the acute lung injury in a couple minutes. You could also have COPD. It can cause asthma and lung cancer. If you have asthma, it can aggravate it a lot more. And you're gonna have more problems with your asthma and your breathing. Now, there have been, uh, there was a, a very short study that looked at the impact that e-cigarettes have on blood vessel function. It can affect the blood flow in the femoral artery. Now, those of you that are nurses out there know that it's in the leg, but for some that are out there that aren't nurses, that's where it is. And it's after just one use. And they use this with uh, MRI scans to, to look at this. When they start using the e-cigarettes, this is where there's the change in the blood flow in the femoral artery. But it does stabilize itself after that. At this point, because it's just a very short study, they're not sure which chemical might be responsible for that problem with the blood flow. And they're not sure if extended use, if you use it for several years, how will it impact normalization? Will the blood flow go back to normal or does it stay with some changes? We also know that vaping can disrupt brain development and it can cause cancerous tumors. We're going to talk about one of the major health effects that we've seen with e-cigarettes. It's associated with e-cigarette vaping associated lung injury, eVALI. And as of January of 2020, 2,668 individuals were hospitalized with eVALI, and these were reported to the CDC. The number of cases peaked in September and has declined since. And we're going to talk about perhaps why that has decreased. 
what they're looking at is that vitamin E acetate is an additive that is put in with THC containing e-cigarettes. And they're really taking a look that the vitamin E acetate is what is causing the lung injuries. But at this point, they can't rule out that um, THC or the non-THC containing products could also cause this. What they found is mostly the individuals with Evali have modified their vaping products. Maybe they're trying to get more out of that, increasing the nicotine, increasing how much THC they're getting. Also, there are individuals who are buying it off the streets. You have to be 21 to buy an e-cigarette. So individuals who are under 21 and want to use an e-cigarette often buy it off the streets. And if it's modified in any way, it can contribute to the risk factor of getting the associated lung injury. And of course, they're taking a look at the THC products. So as of January, there were 60 deaths caused by Evali. And for some individuals, these develop over a few days or it can be a few weeks. Some of the symptoms that they will see mainly is the respiratory system symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, and chest pain. That's usually what brings somebody to a doctor. But they could also have gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, diarrhea. And they could also have weight loss, chills, fever. So there's a lot of different symptoms that somebody might have from vaping or juuling. So those that have been hospitalized, the majority are white and male. But if you look at that median age of 24, that's what's so scary. Somebody who smokes regular cigarettes usually doesn't see health issues until they've been smoking for 30 or 40 years. If you have somebody that's 24 and now is being hospitalized because of a lung injury, they haven't been using that long. And that, so that's what's scary. In uh, last year, there was a 17 year old who died in New York. And then shortly after that, there was a 15 year old in Texas who died. We don't see 17 and 15 year olds dying from regular cigarettes, but they're, we're seeing them with lung injuries early and death early because of, of the uh, valley. Now, if you take a look again, they're really looking at that most of these are caused by individuals using THC containing products. So you can see that 82% that were surveyed said that they reported using a THC product. 33 only used THC. And 50%, 57% reported any nicotine containing products. And you can see that only 14% say that they only use just nicotine products. So you can see that they're taking a look that the THC containing products are the ones that are really causing this. And it's the vitamin E acetate that they are really studying and observing. And vitamin E is found in a lot of things. We find it in our foods like fruits and vegetables and in cosmetic products like skin creams. There is no harm to an individual if they eat it in, in a product or they use it in a skin product that might be on their, that might be applied to the skin. But when it's inhaled, this is where they're seeing that it may interfere with normal lung functioning. So 
all of the re research at this point is leaning towards E acetate causing the E valley. And they have found that in most of the lung samples of E valley patients. Now we know that there are some states that have legalized marijuana for recreational use. And so some of these states also have legalized THC containing vape products. And they can be used for medical use or recreational use. One of the problems is, is that each state has different regulations and they can vary how they approve the process that these THC containing products are manufactured, what ingredients are in there. The testing may be needed to determine different levels of potency. What contaminants are in there? Are there metals and pesticides and pathogens also in those THC containing products? Because it's, there's no federal regulation, each state has a different way of looking at this. So some states may be more inclined to do more testing and others are not. So you, from state to state that have legalized marijuana use, this may be a concern. So we know that they can even legally purchased can contain some harmful substances. Now again, a lot of individuals will purchase their THC products illegally. It may be in states where it's not legal for recreational use, or it may be somebody under 21 who can't get it legally. But there are a lot of different terms that are used in the Northeast where we live and in the South, they usually, the counterfeit ones are usually referred to as dank vapes. But if you go to, towards the West, you may see TKO and smart cart. And in the Midwest, Rogue. When they surveyed the E-Valley patients, they found that there were 152 different brands for THC con containing products. That's a lot of different products that are out there. So where do individuals get THC products from if they can't get it legally? They may get it from friends. They may get it from family. They may get it from dealers on the streets or sometimes online dealers. So there's a lot of ways that individuals who want to use this can get it illegally. So when we take a look at what additives that we're taking a look at those THC products, 75% contain the E acetate. And that's why they're really looking at that as the culprit for the E valley. But there are some that contain triglycerides, a few that contain polyethylene. And these were taken from 78 patients by the FDA. Now again, a, a survey and, and a study of only 78 patients is not a large study, but you can still see that mainly the, it's the E-acetate that is in the THC containing products. But, we also have to know that they're also investigating and studying other substances that, so there may be more than one cause for the valley. Before I discuss this slide, I just want to remind you that because of the associated lung injuries, when we talk about COVID-19, we know that somebody that is vaping is compromising their lung system. And so if they contract COVID-19, they most likely are going to have more severe symptoms because it attacks the lungs. And if they have a compromised system with their lungs, they're going to be more at risk. So we talk about marijuana use. So what's the difference between smoking a joint or vaping 
a THC product. The vaping produces a much stronger high than smoking. It can seriously impair your reaction time. It can impair your cognitive abilities. It can alter your state of consciousness. Reduce the ability to concentrate, whether you smoke a joint or vape, I think that's uh, across the board that there's difficulty concentrating. And either way is going to increase your heart rate and your blood pressure. The CDC guidelines on their recommendations are don't use THC containing products. And because that information has been getting out here, maybe why it has peaked in September and has gone down a little bit because they were advertising, they were out there with, with information about that, that this is what is causing the valley. And they also say avoid buying informal sources from informal sources to obtain a vaping device. Now, again, if you're 21, you can go into a vape shop if this is what you want to do and get a, a, a vape pen. If you're under 21, you are going to be doing that. So even though the recommendations are there, we're still going to see people that are going to do that underage or because maybe it's cheaper on the streets. And it's important not to modify that e-cigarette device in any way or add substances that were not recommended by the manufacturer. So in New Jersey, as I said, you need to be 21 year old to purchase. And any place in New Jersey where you can't smoke, you can't vape. So you can't vape in a restaurant, you can't vape in your office, you can't vape in the stores. And then there was an additional law that was passed to prohibit vaping on any state beaches or state parks. In New Jersey, we have banned those flavored pods. And now only nicotine and menthol are available. And that's important because when we talk about, when we get to youth and vaping, the reason that we ban these flavored pods is because that was what is what's attractive to the youth. Michigan was the first state that banned it. And I'm not sure how many other states, but I'm so glad that New Jersey has decided to ban the flavored pods. Let's talk about vaping and pregnancy. We know that nicotine is a very highly addictive substance. That's why people get addicted to cigarettes, they get addicted to vaping because of the nicotine. But we also know that nicotine is very toxic to the developing fetus. It can affect the brain and lung damage. It can affect other organs. So the danger for pregnant women and the developing babies is they may have preterm birth or stillbirths. And any substance that a fetus is prenatally exposed to, whether it's smoking or drugs or alcohol, and now vaping, it can increase the risk of an infant dying from SIDS. And we know that propellants and flavorings might be harmful. So now in New Jersey, we don't get those flavorings, but the, those flavorings, we never knew what chemicals they were using. This is an infographic from the CDC, which tells pregnant women about the risks of using e-cigarettes while they're pregnant. And you can see that 7% of pregnant women reported using an e-cigarette around the time of pregnancy. And 1.4 reported use during the last three months of pregnancy. And it's important to talk to your physician and talk about how to stop e-cigarettes if you're pregnant. Now, e-cigarette use among pregnant women 
was highest for women who also used regular cigarettes. 39% of regular pregnant users were also current e-cigarette users. Now, regular cigarette use was lower among pregnant women than non-pregnant women. So women are hearing that they shouldn't smoke during pregnancy, but they think that it's okay to vape because they're not smoking. The rate of e-cigarette use is higher in pregnant women than non-pregnant women, and not by much. 3.3 and 3.6 is not much difference, but to know that that many, 3.6% of pregnant women are vaping and exposing their fetus to some of the chemicals, they're, they're exposing them to the heavy metals and the formaldehyde and different chemicals that can cause cancer. While e-cigarettes might expose the developing fetus to fewer toxins, nicotine exposure is and of any kind is harmful. Now, when they say fewer toxins, because a regular cigarette has about 7,000 chemicals in it. So there might be less chemicals, but that doesn't mean that it is safe during pregnancy. This is where we're going to talk about youth and vaping. In 2016, there were 2 million high school and middle school students using e-cigarettes. So that constitutes about 11% of high schoolers and 4.3% of middle school stu students. And the use increased from 2017 to 2019, it increased by 135%. It's kind of scary. So it went from 11 0.7 to 27.5 of high schoolers, and from 3.3% to 10.5% among middle schoolers. Now you're talking about 12 and 13 year olds using these e-cigarettes. And again, the, the flavors is one of the reasons that they use. By 2019, we went from 2 million to 5.3 million middle school and high school students were current e-cigarette users. And you can see we talked about the percentages before. The only percentage I was able to find for adults was from 2017. And the adults is about 2.8%. Even if that increase substantially by 2019. It's still much, much lower than what we see the youth using. And this is one of the biggest reasons why the ban on flavored e-cigarettes. So why do you youth use? Well, because there's been use by a family member or a friend, that's 39%. 31% because of the flavors. Not too many adults are going to go into a vape shop and ask for bubblegum flavored vape. These are meant to attract the youth. Just like cigarettes, these manufacturers are always trying to get new users to replace those that have stopped or died. A lot of them think that it's less harmful than a regular cigarette, and they don't understand all the chemicals that are in it. Some of them say it's easier to obtain than tobacco products, only 5%. So I don't think that that is a large number. Some of them say that they cost less than cigarettes, but again, that's a small percentage. And only 2% feel that they use because they see people in, on TV or in the movies that use them. So why, again, are they popular with the teens? Well, they're curious. This is a new product that's pretty much new product out and, and their friends might be using, and so they're curious. 
teens are always curious about different substances. The kid-friendly flavors, the vaping tricks, and you can see by the picture that's in there, you know, it's coming out his mouth, coming out his nose, so they feel like they can do some tricks with that vape that comes out of the e-cigarette. And there's been a lot of promotion between social media and advertising. And again, you can take a look at 32.2% of high schoolers said that the reason they use was the availability of the flavors. And 26.8%, again, those middle schoolers, those 12, 13, 14 year olds that are using this, again, they're attracted to those flavors, which is why so many of these states now are banning those flavors. We know that the brain does not fully develop until you're about 25 or 26. So the teen brain is still developing. And so if it's exposed to nicotine, it can alter some of that brain development. It can cause lung damage that may not be reversible. It may affect cognitive functioning. And with long-term use, it may affect their physical health or their mental health. We know that the e-cigarette aerosol can irritate the lungs, the throat, and the eyes. And again, because you have this compromised system in, in your lungs, you can be more susceptible to catching cold or catching the flu. And now more susceptible to COVID-19. Youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to move on to regular tobacco cigarettes. They're four times as likely to try a cigarette. So they may not become regular users, but they, they're gonna try it. And they're three times as likely to be current cigarette users. So the estimate is that 43,000 current youth cigarette smokers started with e-cigarettes. Many people insist that e-cigarettes help with stopping regular cigarette smoking. Currently, it is not approved by the FDA for smoking cessation. There's not enough evidence it's insufficient to really say, so they can't advertise it as a smoking cessation device. There have been a few minor studies that found e-cigarettes with nicotine can help smokers stop smoking. And some individuals I've spoken to insist that they help them stop smoking. So, I think the jury's still out, but it's not, it can't be advertised as a smoking cessation device. There are others who use both products, which is called dual use. So 58.8% of e-cigarette users were also regular cigarette users. Some individuals will smoke a cigarette and then the next time they'll vape and then they'll smoke a cigarette and then they'll vape. They'll go back and forth. Sometimes if there's not enough time to have a whole cigarette, they'll take a couple hits off of an e-cigarette to just get that nicotine in their system so they're not going through withdrawal. 29% that are e-cigarettes users were former smokers, and 11.4 had never been regular smokers but now use the e-cigarettes. We have lots of references available. So if you have any questions, you can direct them, as Amy had said, and she will forward them to me. Great, thank you, Judy. We're waiting for some questions to come in on our um, in our question box. 
in the meantime, I do have a few questions that have come in during the presentation. Um, the first is, can people use vaping um, for medical marijuana use? In some states, they do have where they can buy the THC products legally. And so some people might use it for medical use. I think they have to decide which, which is better for them because if they just use marijuana as a medical use, they're not getting all the chemicals that might be in the THC vape product. Where do the heavy metals come from that are in the vape products? That's just the way they're manufactured. I don't know where they come from, but that's what they find in there, in those uh, pods. I have to be frank and make a comment. I, I think it's kind of scary what's in the pods, but uh, we'll move on. Um, is um can you tell us what's known about second or third hand impact of vaping because i um i know that um obviously there's an issue with cigarettes and uh second and third hand um uh exposure well the second hand smoke or the vape contains all the same chemicals that are in the vaping product itself. I haven't found anything about third hand vaping. You know, with cigarettes, if you go outside and smoke and you come in, it's in your hair, it's in your clothes. I haven't read anything about third hand vaping at this point. Okay, well, thank you. Um, how has the law restricting flavored e-cigarettes affected the vape shops? They seem to be uh, well open and running when we're not um, social distancing. Yeah. Well, a lot of vape shop owners complained and they said that their, their sales were gonna go down. My question is, since most of the flavored products were going to the youth, how could that decrease their sales unless they were selling to the youth? Is that how they were getting them? Because it's very interesting how many high schoolers and middle schoolers are using, how do they get these products? Some of them, uh, vape owners have complained and said that it will affect their sales. I think time will tell because most adults are going to want just the regular or the menthol. I don't know, some of those flavors looked interesting, but not the bubble gum, you're right. Um, so do we know about um, vaping in this time of COVID-19? Um, I think you mentioned that the people who vape might be at um, a disadvantage as far as um, once they got uh, COVID-19, once they were infected, um, because their lungs could be compromised. Um, is there anything known about whether they would be at increased risk for COVID-19? I think anybody is at risk for COVID-19, but it depends on how severe those symptoms might be. And I know that everything I've been reading is encouraging people to stop smoking, to stop vaping, because that compromises your lungs to begin with. So if you contract COVID-19, it may be some more severe, you know, you're, you're in that risk factor, just like, over 65, or if you have health problems, or if you have any kind of asthma or diabetes, 
it increases your chances of it being more severe because you're already compromising your lungs. Got it. Um, here are some questions coming in. Um, why is the jewel popular with young people? I think it's popular because it looks like a flash drive so they can conceal it from their parents a lot easier. It doesn't admit as much vape smoke. It's, it's not smoke, but it doesn't admit as much as, as a regular e-cigarette because they admit a lot. Another thing is that they can conceal it more in, in schools. The fat magic markers, some of them will take all the stuff out and stick their jewel in there and actually be able to use it in school because it doesn't admit as much of that vape as some of the other ones. And I think because it, they can get those attractive wraps. You know, those are things that kids like, you know, teenagers like. They like flashy things. <laughs> and sometimes True. because some of them will go, a starter pack is about $50, $60. So some of them will go in together. And how they get these, I think they get through some of the firewalls or whatever on online and get them. And so they'll go in together for that and, and kind of share it. We have another question coming in about um, COVID-19. Um, have we seen young people with more severe cases of COVID-19 who have had a history of vaping? I don't have that information. They're not telling us when we when we see how many are affected and how many deaths, they don't really give us a whole lot of information. I mean, we know that a lot of them are older, some in nursing homes, but the other breakdown I haven't seen unless somebody else has, you know, how many young people are having more severe reaction. Wow, Judy, these questions are really coming in. Um, <laughs> have, have legal THC products been implicated in popcorn lung? Well, no, the, that's not what they're looking at. They're looking at the valley. Uh, so it, that's different than the popcorn lung. The popcorn lung is caused now, a lot of vape shops say they don't have that chemical in that causes popcorn lung. But since there's no law that says they have to tell you what is in that vape product, that e-juice that you're buying, you don't know. But no, there, that's not been associated with the E-Valley at this point. Thank you. Um, well, here's a different one. Can you explain why people don't understand why nicotine is said to be the most addictive chemical? I, I'm not sure if it's considered the most addictive chemical. I mean, we know it's addictive, but if we take a look at opioid use or cocaine use, you know, is it any more addictive than, than those? Um, it is addictive, we know that, but it's also something that you can withdraw from without having to go into rehab. But people know, I think, I don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't understand that a cigarette with nicotine is addictive and still people choose to use. Even knowing that there's some nicotine in vape products and some of the negative effects, people are still going to choose to use. An unfortunate reality. Yes. So here's another question um, that just came in. E-cigarettes are readily available in every type of store and sold to minors. What has been put into place to monitor where they are sold? 
at this point, I don't know what they're putting into place. We do know that with cigarettes, you know, there's a there's a sign on any convenience store that says we we card and you have to be 21 to buy the cigarettes. Some of these places are not carding people for their e-cigarettes. And at this point, I don't know what laws they're going to put in into place. We know with alcohol, if you give alcohol to a minor, there are a lot of laws in place and you can be fined very heavily. As far as I know, I have not been able to find any laws for fines if an adult buys an e-cigarette for somebody that's underage. Yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> How do we solve the problem of vaping on school buses? I had a principal watch as buses rolled in. Some rear windows were open, indicating that the children were vaping. <laughs> I know that some of the schools that we've talked to say that they've, they've caught kids vaping. I think they have to use the same kind of, you know, what happens if these kids were caught on the bus smoking? What What is the bus driver doing? Is, is there, are they making them stop? You know, you can't use this on the bus because you can't smoke on the bus. What's happening when that principal meets that bus and sees who's who's vaping? Are there consequences? So this is where the school needs to kind of get involved and in kind of what is their school policy if, a, if an individual, if a student is caught vaping. They're going to have to decide what their school policy is going to be. Um, so now that we're all, most of us are confined um, in close quarters, um, what is your recommendation to parents who uh, discover that their underage child is vaping? Do you have an, a, a suggestion as to how they can? Well, I think they need to speak to them and let them know that this is not okay with them, that it does contain a lot of, you know, give them information, give them the education, you know, Giselle is probably listening, but she always says, you know, education and knowledge is power. And it's it's true. So if parents learn about it, sometimes parents don't know a lot about e-cigarettes and they think, oh, well, they're they're not smoking regular cigarettes, so okay. So parents need to educate themselves on the dangers of e-cigarettes and vaping and then talk to their their you know, son or daughter, and, you know, let them know this is not okay, this is what it can do, you know, we can help you stop, is it that we have to, you know, there's different ways to stop, they can stop cold turkey, and they may go through a little bit of withdrawal, they can gradually decrease, or they can go to their doctor and maybe get, you know, a nicotine replacement uh, treatment. You know, so there's different ways that they can help their their child stop vaping. The one of, good thing is if they are vaping, they can't get any new ones if they're not going out of the house. Oh, that's true. <laughs> we have to look on the bright side of our current situation. Yes. So, Judy, this has been a, a wonderful um, introduction to e-cigarettes and vaping. Um, can you just mention some resources that are out there for people who want to learn more um, or you know may have discovered their child is vaping and and are looking for uh, different information or uh, organizations that might be able to um, offer them support? Well, I think that if they go just go and do a Google search, that is going to help. You know, if you go in with e-cigarettes and, and treatment or stopping e-cigarettes, you're going to find a, a good resource. 
Oh, I lost you guys. <laughs> uh oh. Um, I think you're still there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you're good. You can, you can see that there's a lot of different references that that um, that we can look at, and you know, there's always like um, Quitnet might have some suggestions. The American Heart Association has information about uh, e-cigarettes. That was a good, um, very quick, brief, concise, that's very good for, for parents. The CDC, they can go to the CDC and get information from the CDC on uh, e-cigarettes too. Great. Do you know if there's any guidance from um, uh, obstetric or pediatric organizations like um, AWA, A1 or ACOG or um, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics? Well, there's a lot of different things. Uh, you can see we get information from Johns Hopkins Hospital and, and Health System. So you can, you know, you can do a Google search and you can find a lot of information from, from all of those sources. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to um, end our webinar. Again, we appreciate your time, Judy, and we appreciate um, all of those folks who have joined us for the webinar want to give a shout out to Monica Smith, who's been handling the technical back end of the program. Um, just a reminder to all of the attendees that in about an hour, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Your feedback is really important to us, so please take the time to complete it. For those who require or request certificates of completion, they will be sent out via email and we'll be using the email you address that you put into your evaluation. So please be sure that um, it is typed incorrectly. And you should receive your certificates within one week. A calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at our website, which is www.partnershipmch.org under the Professional Education tab. We are also pleased to announce that we are offering on-demand recordings of many of our programs, and those are also listed on the website. Hope to have you join us at our next program. Amy Gall signing off for the partnership.